Let's, uh, why don't we get started? Okay, so my name is Mario Sanchez. Welcome to Sumo Logic's Quick Stop webinar. As I said, my name is Mario. I run training here at Sumo Logic. And a few housekeeping items before we get started. So you notice that you're all in mute. And the reason for that is to avoid distraction. We have a very, very large group today. And in order to avoid any distractions, I've muted all of you. However, if you do want to ask a question, feel free to use the go that go to webinar question panel, which a few of you already tried out. Um, I am going to, because it's such a large audience, I'll probably go through all the session, the entire session uh, today, and then I will leave questions till the end. Um, but if you have questions dur during, feel free to send them and I'll, I'll, I'll definitely review all those questions at the end. And then um, to preempt the most common question that I get, uh, the answer is yes, this session will be recorded and I will also so, um, so at the end of the session, I will send you a link to the recording as well as a link to the slides because the slides you'll notice have a lot of links um, uh, and references to other stuff. So I'll be sending that stuff to you as well. All right, so let's get started. Um, Today, my goal is to provide you with some basic understanding of Sumo Logic service and really how it can help you uncover events that are difficult to do with your simple searches or perhaps with your simple grabs. So we're going to go um, learn how to use this tool and get uh, and get beyond that kind of stuff. Um, given that we have quite a few newbies, quite a few new, uh, beginners in this session, I'm going to start with a high level view and then I'm going to start diving into details. So at the completion of this webinar, you're, there's four main things we're going to hit. We're going to understand data collection and notice that I say understand rather than know how to do data collection. The reason for that is that data collection is an administrative topic, how to get your data into the system. We run a completely separate webinar for that. Um, so if you're interested, certainly um, take a peek at, at that other webinar. But what we're going to be focusing the most here is learning how to search your data, assuming that your data is already in Sumo Logic, learning how to search that data, how to parse that data, how to analyze that data. Um, and once you know how to analyze that data, how to take it and start visualizing it and monitoring it through dashboards and alerts. And then last but not least, I'm, uh, we're going to learn how to take advantage of the out-of-the-box content that we, uh, that we already have in our apps. In, in Sumo Logic. And last thing is, um, I'm going to be giving you a lot of tips and tricks that are for best practices, all, all scattered throughout the presentation. So we're going to, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, best best practices as well. All right. So 30,000 foot view, what is Sumo Logic? Well, Sumo Logic helps you gain insights into your growing pool of data uh, that you might have within your complex system. And most of you that are on this call are using Sumo Logic service for at least one of these three uh, use cases. Some of you might be using it for two or three of, of the all three use cases. On the left hand side, you have DevOps. So essentially, for DevOps, we allow these teams to monitor their KPIs so that they can deliver quality software. So they spend less time troubleshooting and more time developing developing code because we help them identify those bugs and identify it um, and, and, and make that troubleshooting time a lot uh, smaller. Um, in the middle for IT ops teams, we help you extract value inform valuable information on things like latencies, um, performance metrics, trends, and really any critical events that are tied to your core system. And for those of you who are using it for, for compliance and security, um, Sumo Logic helps organizations really simplify and automate compliance and security monitoring across their entire stack using what we call predictive analytics. All right, so uh, the, the question that you, we usually get is, what, what data can I ingest? Where can that data come from? And in reality, we can ingest data from just about any source you can imagine, whether that's structured data or unstructured data. And these here are some of the few devices or applications or frameworks um, that you might be using in, or, or in your organization. All of these produce log data that Sumo can ingest and can analyze. Um, the left-hand side can represent your technology stack. So it's um, all the way starting from your network through your virtual environments, your databases, all the way up to your custom application code. Um, and the right-hand side can represent your infrastructure, for example. Little tidbit of fun information. We've actually hired quite a few people from these organizations just to uh, um, enhance our expertise and uh, domain expertise in some of these in here. All right, so at a high level, um, Sumo Logic's data flow goes through these main stages, right? We collect data through what we call collectors and sources. And we're going to talk a little bit about this so you can understand um, what happens in the collection topic. 
But most of our time, we're going to be spending it here on number two and number three. We're going to learn how to search and analyze data. We use what we use what we call operators to analyze our data. And I'm going to be showing you a lot of these operators and the syntax for those. Once you start analyzing your data and you can start charting those, you can actually drop them into dashboards or you can set up alerts to let you know about your critical events that are happening in your environment. All right, so with this in mind, let's begin with data collection. As I said, I'm not gonna cover detail all that, but at a high level, um, this is what uh, uh, collectors and sources are all about. The picture that you have in front of you is, um, is a picture of a, one of our typical customers, Sumo Logic customer. They have a combination of what we call installed collectors, and this is a small agent that sits on your servers and on your host, and that uh, collector would be going against you, uh, would go in and fetching the log files and sending them over to Sumo Logic. Or you could have what we call a hosted collector. In this case, collector C is a hosted collector. Uh, what you would have on host C is some sort of custom script that is posting, uh, it's doing an HTTP post to an endpoint here, which is your collector C and grabbing those log files and sending them over. So a couple of things to keep in mind though. Every single message, every single log message that comes into Sumo Logic gets tagged with what we call metadata fields. So in this example here, you're showing uh, in this in this screen here, I'm showing you how every single message gets tagged with the name of the collector that it came from, the source when that data came from. In this case, it could be um, Apache Access or Apache Error the source host, so in this case it's host A, the source name, which is the name of the log file that that data came from, including the file path. And then the last one, which is bolded here, is source category. And source category can be just about anything that you guys want. <clears throat> Here is the key thing though. Source category becomes pretty important because here's the same exact uh, screenshot I was showing you before or the same, same diagram, but in this case, I've added source category down at the bottom. You notice that for my Apache access data, my source category is WS Apache Access, whereas my Apache Error is WS Apache Error. So I've selected a naming convention that is gonna allow me to do some pretty cool things at the time that I search. Check this out. If I do a search and I say where source category is equal to WS Apache Access, this is going to allow me to search um, across host A and host B without even having to say, look at host A and uh, or host B. But it, it's allowing me to just grab uh, big, uh, big chunks of data to be searched. If I said something like WS Apache Star, that's allowing me to look for Apache access and Apache error across host A and host B. Or if I did something like WS star, um, you get the point. That allows me to look through host A, host B across anything that is a web server, regardless of the brand, whether it is IIS or an Apache web server. So what you're seeing here is um, a naming convention that is very uh, that is robust and it's, it's gonna allow me to easily run my searches and figure out my scope. Okay, so I promise not too much slides. I'm going to start into how to search and analyze and run this through a demo itself. Before I forget, though, um, let me just quickly show you. Uh, most of you probably joined this webinar, registered uh, for this webinar in this Sumo Logic training uh, page. Um, the session that we're running today is this one here, Sumo Logic Quick Start. But for those of you who want to dive even a little deeper, tomorrow we're running this other session, tomorrow and the day after, called Using Sumo Logic. So today I'm going to give you a good taste of what you can do within this hour. But if you want to dive a little bit deeper, um, I'd highly encourage you to uh, join tomorrow's webinar as well. All right. So for those of you who haven't really seen this, let's start from the beginning. What you see here is uh, my search screen. I'm going to make my screen just a little bit bigger so you guys can follow along. Um, and as you could expect, I have a search window in here. And if I just type the word error, it's going to go off and search all my data. It doesn't matter whether my data is coming from Apache, from Box, from my database. Um, it just went out and searched for anything that has the word error in it. It's a good search because I start looking for anything that has a word error. But if you remember, I was mentioning to you that every every uh, message gets tagged with metadata. Um, a better query for this would be if I start searching for anything uh, for my source category. If you remember, source category was one of those metadata fields. So I can say, for example, source category, um, oops, source category equals 
um, Apache Access, for example. And now what I'm looking for in here is only the data for my Apache Access um, uh, source. And I can start looking for, for example, I only want those things that have the word get. I can do it by highlighting um, the value in one of my options and saying and it. And what it does is it just adds it in here. Or I could have just simply typed it myself and say get. And now what's happening is it's going and fetching the last 15 minutes of my Apache Access data that have the word get in it. Notice that I did not have to put the word and. The and is implicit. It assumes that you want to say anything that has Apache Access and the word get. Um, but if you were specifying the word or, the one has to be explicitly uh, mentioned in here. So all these uh, get or without the and um, are meaning the, the same thing in here. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the time frame that you see here. So I, I pulled data for the last 15 minutes. Um, you could choose last 60 minutes, last three hours, or any of the values that are shown in here. But what if I wanted to pull, let's say, last 45 minutes worth of data? It's not one of the options in here. Let me show you the syntax for that. Uh, it's pretty straightforward minus 45m. That's going to be pulling the last 45 minutes worth of data. So you can use this name, this convention in here. Uh, M is for minutes, D is for days, H is for hours. The cool thing also is that you have this little pop-up here in black that is showing you what is going to be pulling. So if I chose minus 45h, meaning the last 45 hours, it's showing me that it's going from today um, at one, uh, I'm sorry, from today at 1014 all the way back to 1212 at 114 and 56 seconds. So this kind of shows you where that is going with that. Um, you can also do things like this. I can say minus 30 min uh, 45 minutes to minus 30 minutes. And what this is doing is it's pulling 15 minutes worth of data with an offset of fi of uh, 30 minutes. So go back 30 minutes ago and pull 15 minutes worth of data from minute 45 all the way to minute 30. All right, pretty straightforward so far. What if I wanted to pull data from a very particular time frame? You can always enter uh, dates in here as well. So if I wanted to go back a couple of days and pull data from 8 o'clock in the morning all the way to um, uh, 8.05, I could do that as well. So in this case, I am pulling only five. Oops, it said it was invalid because I added a dash in here. There we go. So in this case, it's pulling five minutes worth of data for a very specific time frame. Again, you get that little pop up that is showing you exactly what time you're pulling. You're putting in, you're pulling out. Uh, you notice that I didn't have to specify a year because it assumes it's this year. And I did not have to specify AM or PM because um, if you don't specify anything, it is, assumes it's AM for that. Okay. All good stuff. Let me uh, just go back and do it easy and pull the last 15 minutes worth of data. Uh, I'm going to pull all my Apache Access data and show it like that. So here is my Apache data for the last 15 minutes. Let me take a step back for a second. So right now, what I'm showing you is how to start taking your data, like say your Apache Access data, and start making sense out of that. Um, similar to a cooking show where they show you the cooked or the, the the finished meal, and then they show you how to prepare that meal. I'm gonna I'm gonna do the same thing here for a second. I want to show you some of the dashboards that are out of the box content. This is this is content that already exists within Sumo Logic. That all you have to do is install it. And what this is doing is it's looking through my it's loading my Apache data into these dashboards. And this is what the final product. This is what you eventually want to get to. For example, here. For Apache Access, it's showing you it's showing my visitor access types. It's showing me uh, visitor locations, so worldwide versus just visitors in the U.S. Um, then it's giving me a breakdown by state or a breakdown by country. Again, I did not have to configure anything in order to get these dashboards. All I had to do was install the app, which for Apache Access, and because we know what Apache logs look like, we can parse those logs and start providing all this information for you. So I wanted to take a pause and let you know that there is content already built that I can easily take advantage of. Um, even better is the fact that for any of these dashboards that are in here, let's say this one's of server errors over time, I can click on that dashboard 
And what it's going to do is it's going to take me and it's going to show me the query, the actual query that was put together uh, to build that dashboard. Don't worry about, about the syntax right now. Um, hopefully by the end of this hour, you will know exactly what this syntax is all about and you'll be able to, uh, to build this query. But my point is that you can install this already pre-built dashboards and then you can click on any of the things that are existing in here and it's going to take you to the query behind it. So the point is you don't have to start from scratch you can always take something that already exists and change it. So in this particular case, if I didn't care for client error, which are my 500s, my, so notice that it's saying where status code matches 500s, well, maybe I care for server errors. All I have to do is put change that five to a four, and now I've created a whole new query that allows me to look at my 404s or my 401s or my 403s. So you notice how it's pretty simple to take content that already exists and tweak it to your particular needs. Okay, so with that said, let's go back to where we were and uh, and just start kind of from scratch. Let me show you how to take this data and start learning about it. Um, so you, you saw a couple of things in here. You notice how I can search for a particular source category. I can play with the timeframes. This histogram here in the middle is just showing me number, it's showing me a count of messages that it found. So at this particular minute, it found about 7,965 messages. And it's just showing me a, a count of what it found for the last 15 minutes. If I had selected 60 hours, that uh, I'm sorry, 60 minutes, that histogram is going to change a little bit and show me um, slightly different buckets in here. <clears throat> okay, so so far so good. Um, I'm showing you how to search that data. Down here at the bottom, you have all the different results that come back from that query. You notice that uh, it's it's about four four thousand pages of results. So that's quite a lot of results, and some of you might have seen this before. You notice that my search was paused. The reason that this gets paused is because it says, well, you've already reached more than 100,000 messages. Do you really care to look at all these messages? Are you really going to eyeball through all these messages? If the answer is yes, then you can easily resume that query and just continue querying. But most likely than not, you were just sampling some of the data and you just wanted to see what kind of information is in here so that you can do something with it. For example, let's uh, let's do something with it. Let's start parsing some of this data. Let's choose, let's say, let's 15 minutes worth of data, and let's do a little bit of parsing so that we can start identifying some of the values that are in here. Um, I chose Apache Access because most of you are familiar with it. Let me take a message here at the top, and, and let's try to dissect it. So as most of you know, here's my IP address, here's my timestamp, here is the method of what I'm doing, the verb, and then I have an um, I have a URL, I have the uh, HTTP 1.1 that is in there, a status code, and the size. So maybe what I want to do is I, I want to start parsing this so I can identify how many status, how many 404s am I getting? Is it a huge number of 404s? So let me show you parsing. How do you go about grabbing what's in here and parsing it out? I'm going to grab uh, from this particular one, I'm going to grab this here and say, okay, highlight this stuff and do some parsing on this particular message. So the get is always going to be there, but I'm going to say anything you find after the get and before that HTTP, I'm going to extract that value and that's going to be my URL. And then anything you find after that HTTP 1.1, that is going to be my status code. And anything you find after that, that's going to be the size of my um, of my message. And if I click submit, you notice that what it did here is it built that parsing statement for me. Of course, I could have built that myself, um, but uh, it was just easier to do it through the UI. So now I can hit on start. And what you guys are going to notice is that here's my message on the right hand side. And what it did is it parsed out those fields that I requested. Time gets parsed by default. So it always parses out that timestamp. But it parsed out the size, it parsed out the status code, it parsed out the URL. And now here's a really cool thing that I can start doing things like count by status code because status code is now a field that I can use for my um, for my um, um, aggregations and whatever operations I want to do. So this now is giving me a good idea of how many 404s I've had in the last 15 minutes. 
Okay, so so far what I've shown you is how do I can start searching. Um, best practices is always try to use some, uh, some metadata. In this case, I'm using source category for searching. But the next thing that you wanna do uh, most likely is you wanna start parsing. So you can identify fields that exist in your messages. So here's the entire message. I wanna start parsing the fields that exist in there. So from a parsing perspective, let me go to the documentation and show you a couple of options that are available to you. Um, there is, There are a quite a few different parse operators that are available to you. Um, what I just showed you right now is called a parse anchor. And the reason for that is because if you have a predictable pattern and there is something like the word get that is always going to be there, then you can use it as an anchor and start parsing that way. But if you don't have predictable patterns, you have variable patterns per se, you can use uh, regex. And most of you probably have used regex at some point or other, um, just to make sure that you're, we're all on the same page. Here's an example of how you can parse a, um, how you can parse a URL um, using regex. So I'm just gonna copy this, go back to our um, stuff in here. I'm going to comment out this parse statement for a second. And I'm going to place the one that I just copied from the um, from the uh, documentation and run start on this. And what you notice this is doing is it's looking for a pattern like this that says um, it's looking for this pattern that says. Oop, I shouldn't count by status code uh, to run this query. Um, it's looking for this pattern that says, find me anything that has um, a three-digit number, a one to three-digit number, a period, a one to three-digit number, a period, and you get the point. So look for this pattern and store it in a field called IP address. And that's exactly what it just did in here. It took my message, it found an IP address, and it stored it into this new field called IP address. So for those of you who, um, who are familiar with um, where is my, here it is. For those of you who are familiar with regex, this should be a breeze. Um, you can use parse regex to uh, parse anything that you want in your messages. But also, there's a few other ones in here. If your data is in JSON format, guess what? We know what JSON format looks like, so there is a JSON uh, operator. If you send us the data in key value pairs, meaning name equals Mario, company equals Sumo Logic, we know how to parse key value pairs. If you send us in CSV format, we know how to do that. If it's in some other delimited log, like say it's through a tab or a colon, we can use split. If you send us XML, we can use that. And there's a few other options in here to read about um, as well that, that are available to you. So parsing is one of the biggest things that you want to do, making sure that you can take your data and start parsing it. Now, the next question is, um, what if I want to save these parsing statements? So if you notice, I, I have a couple of different parsing statements in here. Um, what if I want to make sure that these parsing statements get saved? I want to parse the IP address, but I also want to parse the URL, the status code, and the size. And I want to make sure that everybody in my organization can do that. You'll notice here that we have something called the field extraction rules. In the field extraction rule, as it says, it's exactly that. It's a rule that tells Sumo Logic how to extract fields and extract them permanently. So this is an administrative activity, but I'm going to show it to you just as, as you can see how it's put together. Under Manage, there's something called a field extraction. And under there, you can create field extraction rules. For example, I could create one called um, Apache logs. And I can say anytime I have something coming in for source category equals Apache access, I want you to apply the following parse expression. So in here, I can knock myself silly here writing my parse regex. Or for those of, for those like me who are a little bit lazy, we provide some templates. We provide some, we know what Apache access logs look like. So here's a template that is going to parse that. So I can say, yep, Let's use this template. And as you notice, it's going to parse the IP address, but it's also going to parse the method. It's going to parse the URL. It's going to parse the status code, the refer, and all that good stuff for me. So when does this parsing happen? This happens at the time that the data is ingested into Sumo Logic. So every time it's ingesting data, it looks for the source category. And if it matches this one, it says, great, apply this parsing rule to it, and now those fields are gonna be available to anybody in the organization. I'll show you how, because I've already created one. There's one here called Apache Access. And if you notice, it's actually that same parse statement that I just wrote in there. 
So with that in mind, knowing that a field, a, a field extraction rule already exists, let me show you what actually happens. Let me get rid of this stuff here for a second and just run a search on source category equals Apache access. So there it is. I just ran it plain and simple. Source category equals Apache access for the last 15 minutes. Look here on the bottom left hand side. This is called your field browser. And in this case, my field browser has my method, my referrer, it has my source IP, my status code. These fields are here because there is a field extraction rule already in place. Therefore, it's already finding these, these fields that I can easily start using. I can do now something like count by status code. Why can I do that? Because, oh, sorry, I did it in all in caps. Um, why can I do that? The reason I can do this is because um, status code already exists as a field and it's going to give me um, the values for status code um, because status code is already a field that has been parsed before. All right. Let me comment this out for just a second, just to show you. So in addition to those fields that I parse, the source IP, the status code, the URL, the user agent, you also have the fields that are uh, metadata, source category, source host, source name, collector. So there it is. You have the fields that are coming um, out of the box as metadata, as well as the fields that are part of the field extraction rule. Now, other things that are available to you, the other advantage of these field extraction rules is that they actually give you a lot of statistics as well. Not only does it parse them, but it's giving me here information saying, you know, about 70% of the uh, of the status codes that you get in your messages are 200 and only about 4% or 4.5% are 404s. So you get a lot more information once you start doing this field extraction rule information in here. Okay, good stuff. So a uh, big reminder is uh, one of the next things you guys want to start doing is you want to start parsing your data so you can take advantage of this kind of information. But let's continue with a little exercise here. I'm going to, of course, in this hour, I can't show you all our operators. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to show you uh, operators that you probably will be using 80, 90% of the time. Count is one of them. I'm showing you now how I can, I can uh, do a count of status codes. I could have done a count by URL if I wanted to as well. I could have done a count by size or anything that I want in here. And then I can sort them uh, to see which URLs are getting the most uh, counts out of this in here. So let's go back to status codes just because everybody understands uh, error codes, um, 500s, 404s, and that kind of stuff. All right. If, um, if I am part of the uh, IT team and I see that I have a few 404s, I probably want to find out, um, or perhaps maybe we just deployed code and I want to find out if did, did these 404s all happen at once or, did, or were they distributed across my 15 minutes worth of data. So I'm going to show you a new operator called time slice and what time slice does is as it names suggests, it slices your time and then allows you to look at your data broken by that time slice. So in this case, I'm saying now count by status code at my time slice. Notice I use an underscore in here. The reason for that is because any resulting value from an operator that you use, you can call it again with just using an underscore in front of it. So now in here, you see that I have time slices and I have status codes. And what this tells me is that um, at 1016, for status code 200, I had a count of 393. And for at 1029, for status code 304, I had 1,235. And you get the point. Still a little bit hard to read. So I'm going to show you a new operator called transpose. And as the name suggests, what it allows me to do is change this list into a table, very similar to what a pivot does in Excel. So I can say my row is going to be my time slice. I'm just going to copy it here. And my column is going to be my status code, um, status code. And what you'll notice in here now is that you can easily see, because I now see that at minute 17, I had these many stat, uh, status codes or, or these many number of counts per status code. And I can see at minute 18, 19, and so on. So you could easily see that with like three lines and three simple operators, I've now 
have good visibility of what's happening with my status codes in my servers um, or in my Apache environment. And going from something like this to graphing it is a piece of cake. Now I can just say, okay, put a bar chart and show me my status codes or put a line chart and start showing me my status code. Put a, um, um, a, a pie chart if I want to, an area chart. So you notice how it's pretty easy to now start visualizing this and putting it out there. Okay. Let's say that we're going to do a line chart so that we can see some values in here, or, or maybe even a bar chart so we can see that clearly the 200s are towering over everything else. So what if I didn't want my 200s? I could turn them off in, out here, and now I see only the resulting values. Let's also turn out this 304s, for example. So I could do this kind of stuff, uh, but that that... Uh, change here is just temporary while I'm looking at this dashboard. What if I wanted to remove my 304s and my 200s? Well, it's as simple as adding a where clause. So I could do something, um, I could do something like, uh, let's just go in here and put a little where um, status code equals 200 or status code equals 304. But since I do not want those, what I can do is I can just put a not in front of them. And now what you'll notice is that I have permanently removed the 304s and the four and the 200s from my query. So the syntax is not that complex. Yes, it is. It is not. Um, it is a different syntax, but uh, it's fairly easy to understand, especially if you take a uh, if you take a query that already exists and you start looking at it. And that's where those apps that already uh, out of the box content comes into play. Remember, I was showing you these Apache dashboards that already exist. Um, if you take any of those and you open them up, it's pretty easy to start figuring out what is it that they can do in here. All right, so there you go. In uh, in in very easy, uh, in with a few simple operators, I was able to create a graph that is showing me my status codes. It's ignoring a few of the status codes I don't care to see. I graphed it. I could play with some of these graphs. We don't have time to show you all of them, but I'm going to quickly show you here. I could do something like perhaps I want to change the series and I want to highlight my 404s. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my 404s in a line chart instead. So there you go. Here is a relation of my 404s, which are highlighted with a line, versus all my other status codes, which are shown in a bar chart. In a second, um, I'm going to show you how to add this to a dashboard. But before we go there, I wanted to start showing you a few other operators that are available to you. Of course, we're gonna, not going to have time to go through all of them. And I encourage you to join tomorrow's session um, or the rest of this week if you want to see a little bit more. But at least I want to show you a couple of ones in here. Um, here is an operator called an outlier. Um, let me walk you through what this query is doing. This query is saying, all right. Go to source category equals Apache access and only select those messages that have a status code of 404. Remember the end is in implicit, so I don't have to specify it. Then time slice everything by one minute and then give me a count of those status codes and just name it status code. So all I did was rename that field to uh, status code. Instead of, instead of the word count, it's gonna say status code. Um, so if you look at my query in here, um, the results for my query were the word count, right? Um, but I, I was just changing those results. Okay, so in this case, I uh, create a count of those status codes by time slice, and then I use this operator. And here's the really cool thing about this operator. When I use outlier on the field called status code, it creates not only the count, which we renamed into status code, but it creates an upper limit, a lower limit, a standard error, an indicator violation, a mean and standard code. That's what this outlier operator is doing for me. It's, it's trying to identify any outliers by calculating standard deviations and upper and lower levels. I have a few options in here that I specified as well. Before I go through the options, let me show you what the result of this query is, and then I'll come back to these uh, to these variables in here. So here's the result in a table, but if I show you in a view what it's doing is, it's showing me what the, the, the line right in the middle is showing me the count of um, 404s that I have had. And the gray area that you see around it, or the light blue area that you see around it, is this, are the standard deviations 
at that point in time. It's saying, okay, at this particular point in time, here is two standard deviations. That two is coming from here. That threshold is the number of standard deviations that you're selecting. Um, the other thing that you see here is that we're missing about 10 data points in here. And the reason for that is because we said, I want you to use a window of 10 to calculate that standard deviation. Meaning for this particular point in time here, let's say, go back 10 data points and use the values of those 10 data points to calculate what the standard deviation should be now. So again, mathematical is just go back and uh, use 10 data points to understand what the standard deviation should be now and plot it in here. These pink triangles here are the cases where I happen to be outside of that standard deviation. So it's, uh, it's highlighting for me my outliers, the points where I am outside of that standard deviation. Consecutive simply means, do you want me to show you every single time you have an outlier? For example, in here, I have two different outliers. Or if I said, I want you to show me only when I have two errors, only show me the third or the fifth error, um, that's what this would be doing in here. Just showing you the cases where uh, you've had two consecutive um, standard deviations. So in this particular case, look at this one. This is outside of the standard deviation, but it's not highlighted as an outlier because it did not have another one happening with it right next to it. So it's saying that uh, we don't have um, an error, if you will. And then last but not least, direction just says, do you want me to show you those errors that are above this threshold and below this threshold or just above or just below the threshold in there? So this is what the syntax looks like. So again, Outlier builds for you all these different values, all these different other columns, so that it can figure out when you have outliers in your counts out there. Incredibly useful when you want to start alerting around uh, anomalies in your environment. The next one I wanted to show you is uh, this other operator called the lookup operator. And what lookup allows me to do is, in this particular case, I am parsing the IP address and I store it in a field called client IP. And then I run this one saying, go and look up for the latitude and the longitude from this service called GeoDefault, where IP equals that client IP that I just parsed out there. And then count by latitude and longitude. And if you look at the results in here, it gives me a count of all my different latitudes and longitudes, which then can easily be turned into a map that looks something like that, just giving me counts of where things are coming from. Um, of course, you could find a little more detail if you wanted not just latitude and longitude, but rather you would like, um, um, let's say, country or region or zip code. Uh, let me go back to that help menu here for a second and just do like a geo lookup um, search and this will show you um, map charts let's see uh, let's go in here this will show you how this is used so here's an example of how it can be used i was only looking for look looking for lookup uh looking looking up latitude and longitude but let's grab all this let's let's grab uh all these other values so that you can see how it works um, I'm going to go in here and say, uh, grab everything from here, comma, latitude, country code, and metric code. And then I'm going to do a sorting by that as well. So if I run this query now, what you'll see is, uh, let's go back to the table view. It's going to give me all those values in here. So now I'm, now I'm not only getting latitude and longitude, I'm getting region, country name, country code. What if I only wanted those things found in, uh, in the US? Then I could do as simple as doing a where clause, right? So of course I have to do my where clause after the lookup, otherwise I don't have the value. Um, so I could do a where uh, country code equals, and I can just put the value that I care for in there. And it's as simple as that. So now I'm seeing only those with country name, US or country code US, I should say. And if I map those, you will see that it's only showing me those values that are found in the US itself. Okay, super. I see a few uh, a few questions that have lit up. I probably will I'll resist from answering them just yet, so that we can get through this, and then I'll I'll uh, I'll field the questions uh, at the end. Um, one, two more things that I'm going to show you from an analytics perspective, and then we're going to move into dashboards. The other thing that I want to show you is uh, um, a 
a very cool um, feature that we have called log reduce. Let me just search, search for uh, security data. Search category equals, uh, I think I have some data that is called snort data. And my snort data is just giving me a lot of information about attempted information leak, a network trojan was detected. So a little bit of information on security here. Um, however, it'd be pretty hard for me to go through all these messages and try to identify what they are. So I'm gonna hit this easy button here called log reduce. And what log reduce is doing right now is it's looking at those 63 pages worth of data and it's consolidating them into signatures. It's saying, listen, you have about 431 messages that all look the same. They all say file access classification attempt leak. Of course, they're going to have a different date and they probably have a different IP address. But for the most part, the messages kind of say the same thing. Um, here's a whole bunch of other messages that have this thing. So what it did is it brought down those 63 pages worth of data to one page worth of data. And what I can now start doing is sifting through a much smaller list to try to identify what are the things that are really happening in my environment. Um, one of the helpful things is you can always sort by count and look at those things that are only happening once. So in this case, I see that I have a couple of suspicious files that were detected. I can go and focus on those things that are that seem to be a little more strain, uh, strange in my environment. So it's almost like looking for a needle in a haystack when you don't really know what that needle looks like. Um, and that's what log reduce is all about. All right, before I change into dashboard, the last thing I'm going to show you is something called Lifetail. So you saw me doing a lot of searches where uh, where I choose, like, say, source category, and then I start looking for trends and what kind of stuff. What if I wanted to see in real life what is really happening with my Apache access environment? Um, for those of you who are developers, you know that this is pretty hard because a lot of times you don't even have access to your production environment. Well, what we provide here is this tool called Lifetail. And what Livetail allows me to do is exactly as you expect. I can run a tail on not just one host, but I'm running it across all the hosts that would happen to have Apache access on it. So super, super cool because I can say, well, I really only want to see those that have a 404 in it. And by the way, why don't you start highlighting the word uh, Mozilla and how about the word homepage on them, right? Um, so you can do quite a bit of uh, um, exploring through this and, and you can pause it, you can resume it, you can move to the bottom, you can have a, a few different Lifetail sessions running. But the, 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 the goodness here is that all of a sudden as a developer, I actually have access to start tailing a lot of these logs in here. Last thing I'm going to mention about this is that um, you, there is also a command line interface for this. So if I go to the docs in here, um, here is Lifetail itself, but there is a CLI um, that you can use. You can just download it. This is the, the stuff here. You can just download it from GitHub. But the beauty of that is that then once you've downloaded, you can do things like this. You can say, all right, run Lifetail where source category calls Apache access, for example, and then pipe those values and grab them and, and then start running your grabs. Um, you can even push it out to a text file and all that good stuff. So just a great way to have, have the ability to start live tailing into your logs through, um, through this uh, live tail tool in here. Okay, um, I've, 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 I've shown you quite a bit. Um, let me talk a little bit now about, about dashboards themselves. So by the way, I'm gonna share these slides here which go through a lot of what I, I talked about just now. Um, I thought it was a little better to show you in, um, in a demo format, but I want to jump into dashboards themselves. So dashboards, as the ones that I showed you before, remember I was showing you these guys here, Apache Access, and these are the dashboards that come out of the box. Dashboards are made uh, through a series of panels. In this case, this particular dashboard has four different panels. But behind each one of these panels, clearly there was a query that built what was uh, what was behind it. So each panel has a query behind it, and um, you can do additional drilling down into each of these panels. So if I click on a panel, it'll take me to the query behind it, or you can change that div that uh, that behavior so that it drills to, a, to another dashboard if you want it to as well. 
Here's the different types of uh, visualizations that you can use. I've shown you a few of these. So let me just jump into, uh, into this uh, session and show you how I can build a dashboard from here. Remember my chart that I had built before? It's as simple as saying add to dashboard. I can give it a name. Let's say 404s versus um, my, or, or highlighting my 404s. That's what I'm gonna call it, highlighting my 404s and I can add it to a dashboard that already exists or I can add it to a brand new dashboard. Let's call it my first dashboard in here. And if you click on add, what is happening now is it created a new tab and this tab is just going to have a uh, that first dashboard that I created. And I can just add it, move it or do whatever I want in here with my dashboard. Okay. While that stuff is happening, I'm gonna just uh, add a few more. Uh, why don't we use the ones we had here? Remember, I was plotting my stuff. Let's add this one to my dashboard as well. I'm gonna click Add Dashboard, Plotting Requests. Let's add it to my first dashboard and click on Add. And while that thing is loading, let's add the third one as well. I think I did an uh, outlier one in here. So let's add this to that dashboard as well. I'm gonna add it to that my first dashboard, click on Add. So you notice how simple it was, I was able to quickly take three queries that I had built, um, slap them into a dashboard, and there you go. It was as easy as this. Okay, there's quite a few things that you can do with these dashboards. You can decide to share them. So uh, I can share them with anyone in my, the organization. Here is the link. There's a couple of advanced options. I can say, if someone doesn't have access, say, to the Apache access data, I can still share this dashboard and they would still see, be able to see that data in this particular dashboard, although they won't see it anywhere else. So you can share your dashboard if you want to. You can toggle your dashboards from a dark theme if you want to put this in your operations center, or you can leave it in your light theme if you wanted to. You can also add panels like title panels. Um, this is my, or actually let's call this uh, Apache overview. Let's say this was my Apache overview dashboard um, and click submit. And here is my, uh, here's my title, which I can easily just move and drag and move around in here. And I can also add panels that are just text panel. And the reason for this is because uh, understanding your data. You might be the one who built this dashboard, but it could be someone else who's actually reading through this. So you might want to give him a little bit of an explanation of what this dashboard is all about. Um, don't try to read this. this is in a different language. Um, you can add some links to other dashboards if you wanted to as well. So if you click submit, there it is. Here is a little bit of an explanation. I can move this around. I can move my dashboards to fit the format that I want and you, you get the point. Um, this is all configurable and easily movable to whatever you need. But there you go. In less than five minutes, I was able to take panels that exist and create dashboards for them. I was able to share them. And of course, you can do things like delete, star them, refresh them, full screen, and all that good stuff. Now, this dashboard requires someone to open it and actually run it. However, um, if you, uh, well, right now I'm in editing mode. Let me let me move out of the editing mode and let's say this dashboard shared. Someone could come in here and look at this dashboard and they could do things like, perhaps I wanna see this run not for 60 minutes, but for 15 minutes instead. Or maybe I wanna see this one run for uh, um, three hours. Or they could come in here and say, well, I want this dashboard to, to be run for all, everything to be run for the last 60 minutes, in which case it resets all my stuff in here or I wanna use the defaults in there. But what if you wanna share this in your operation center? What if you wanna put it up on a screen and you want it to refresh on a regular basis? That's what this live mode is all about. All you'd have to do is toggle it, it switches to live mode, and what it does then is it's gonna be refreshing every second or every two seconds so that um, you don't have to be refreshing this dashboard. All right, one last thing I wanna show you in here is if I'm still in edit mode, one of the things that I can do is I can add filters to these dashboards. And that's what this little guy here is all about. I can add a filter because I'm the creator of this dashboard. I can say, well, let's allow people to use this dashboard, but enter their own IP address. So I'm gonna edit this and say, enter IP in question. And therefore, when someone is using this dashboard, so let me be, let me go 
be done with the editing. And let's say that someone else comes here to use this dashboard. They're looking at the dashboard as it stands, but they can open the filters and enter uh, an IP address that they would want to specify so that they can look at these values just for that particular IP address. Or it could be a user, it could be a region, it could be whatever it is in particular that you want to use this for. So with that in mind, you can use dashboards as templates, of, as, as tools to troubleshoot and to allow people to do some forensics in your data by providing some specific um, by providing some specific filters here that people can use. All right, let me rush a little bit because the last thing that I wanna show you is uh, I wanna talk a little bit about alerts. Um, the ability to, um, let me skip these the ones that are here. So alerts allow you to, um, to notify you of what's going on in your environment. And alerts are pretty simple to set up. Let me show you a very easy example using, um, using one of the queries that we had in place here. There's this, here's this one. Remember our source category equals Apache access. So we're trying to identify the status codes that are happening out there, right? Um, so in this case, it's, uh, let's, let me just put this back to one and let me put a threshold of two in here and run this query. So this is saying, okay, identify all those, all the four of fours and let me know when I have outliers. So in this case, I have an outlier here and I have an outlier there and I have an outlier. So I would want to have an alert happen whenever there is an outlier. The way that I can do this very easily is, um, let me look at the data. You see there's a field here called status code violation. Um, guess what, whenever I have an outlier, that field is set to one. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna add a little where clause. Let me copy this value in here. Oh, I wasn't able to copy it, so I'm just gonna type it. I'm gonna add a where clause here it says, um, that says um, where status, status code violation is greater than zero. So whenever I have a status, oh, I misspelled it. Uh, whenever I have a status code violation greater than zero, um, this is going to filter those out and it's only gonna give me results if I actually have a violation. If I have no violations, this is gonna yield absolutely no results. So with that in mind, let me show you how to schedule uh, uh, an alert. The mechanics are super simple. Um, you go to save as, you save your, uh, you save your search, you provide a description and all that good stuff. But here there is an ability to schedule this search. You can click on schedule the search, specify when I wanna schedule it for. Let's say I want this to run on an hourly basis. I wanna run the last 60 minutes. I can specify which time zone I want that thing to run. And then with the alert condition, I can say, send me a message every time the search is complete or probably more interesting, send me a notification only if the following condition is met. And in my case, where the number of results is greater than zero. Remember, if I had no violations because of this where clause, I I'm not gonna get results. Therefore, the alert is not gonna trigger. But if I do have violations, the number of results is gonna be greater than zero, and I can then be alerted of what's going on in here. From an alert type, I have a few options, and I won't have the ability to go through all of these today. Um, the simplest one, obviously, is email, the ability to uh, to just send an email to someone um, of, of what is going on, sumo, sumo logic, sorry about that. Um, or uh, you could do things like webhooks. You can send alerts to like a hip chat, to a pager duty, to a Slack, um, anything that has a REST API that we can connect to as well. Um, for those of you interested in the other options in here, we'll definitely be discussing them in the next couple of days on that uh, using Sumo Logic session. Uh, but basically, you have the ability to set up your scheduled alerts. You can send them through like a webhook or like an email um, uh, situation, and then you can customize that payload if you want to. Click on save, and every on an hourly basis, this query is going to run, and if it finds any results, it's going to be sending an alert to uh, to wherever destination you have chosen in here. So the mechanics of creating these are super, super simple. Um, the more interesting thing is, and I'm going to share these slides with you, I would highly recommend you read through this blog. Um, the, the more important thing is creating alerts that are meaningful, rather than just alerts that give you a lot of noise um, that are out there. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is apps. I did show you already that you actually have quite a few apps, and I showed you the ones for Apache in here. Um, but 
if you haven't done so yet, I would encourage you to go to library. And under library, if you go to apps, you will see here all the out of the box content that we have already. If you're loading Amazon CloudFront data, here's dashboards that already come out of the box with about 80 or 90% of the data that you're looking to solve from there. If you're looking for CloudTrail data, um, if you in just CloudTrail data, here's some dashboards that will help you on that. If you are loading MongoDB data, Again, here's dashboards that are showing you your queries, your replication, the sharding. So we've worked with a lot of customers that are ingesting this kind of data and we get a good sense of what kind of information they're looking from that. Um, so this gives you a good list of out of the box content. We also have another tab called the preview tab. And the interesting thing about preview is these are apps very similar to the uh, or identical to the apps shown in, in the apps uh, tab here, except that um, we re re released them recently and we're still asking for your feedback so that you can give us feedback and we can easily bake it back into the app itself. So here's some apps for metrics for RDS. If you have, um, if you have a database in Amazon, you can uh, install this RDS metrics um, uh, app in here or CrowdStrike, Observable Networks and Salesforce. And again, we encourage you guys to let us know what other things you want here. So if you find that there are some app that you we don't have that you would like us to, do, to have, um, let us know. Go under help, feature request, and let us know what kind of stuff uh, we should be working on. All right. So with that said, uh, in summary, what we've gone through today is uh, you know that we can now ingest any types of logs, whether they're structured or non-structured. We've run through how to start querying and analyzing your data using the operators, um, how to visualize your data through charts, how to start creating dashboards out of your charts. We found out how to cr uh, create alerts and, and alert you on those critical events. And if there's two things that I would say I want to call to action for those of you who are getting started, the first one is work with your administrators and ensure that you have a robust source category convention, naming convention. Uh, if you don't, feel free to reach out to us or to me, Mario at Sumo Logic, and I'd be happy to connect you with the right person so we can help you on that front. And the second one is start setting up your field extraction rules. This is going to make your life so much easier. Plus, it's going to make the whole system perform a lot better because the parsing all happens uh, right before you, before you start querying in the system. So with that in mind, let me open it up to a few questions uh, that you might have.